Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 32, Prince Eugene, Viceroy of Italy and Napoleon's stepson. This episode is brought to you by NapoleonicImpressions.com. Check out their website for unique gifts and souvenirs inspired by the Napoleonic era. Prince Eugene, the son of Josephine, might be the only instance of nepotism working well in Napoleon's empire. He had a battle record of four wins and two losses, and fought in a number of other battles under the command of his famous stepdad. It should be noted that even in his younger years of tutelage under Napoleon, he was a great benefit with Napoleon remarking, quote, if there is a cannon shot, it is Eugene who goes to see what it is. If I have to cross a trench, it is he who gives me a hand. End quote. In addition to commanding Napoleon's armies in Italy during the waning years of the empire, Eugene was one of the few who remained steadfastly loyal. Even after Napoleon divorced his mom in 1809, even when disaster struck in the 1812 retreat out of Russia, even after Marshal Murat aligned against him in Italy, and even after the Allies offered him the crown of Italy, Eugene would not turn. He refused all offers and maintained his obedience until Napoleon's first abdication in 1814. As Napoleon astutely summed up, quote, Eugene, has never caused me the least chagrin." End quote. Eugene Rose de Bourgogne was born in Paris, France in September 1781. He was the son of Alexander de Bourgogne and Josephine, the soon-to-be Empress of Napoleon. Alexander and Josephine had married two years earlier in 1779. Alexander was a political figure and served in the French Royal Army under Louis XVI. During the chaotic times of the French Revolution, he was named a general in the Army of the Rhine. But he was guillotined in 1794 by the revolutionary government for poor performance in the field and for having royalist sympathies. His execution left Josephine to care for Eugene and his younger sister Hortense all by herself. To make matters worse, Josephine was briefly imprisoned for three months. At the time of his father's execution, Eugene was apprenticing to be a carpenter. In 1795, the alleged first meeting of Eugene and his soon-to-be stepfather occurred when the young lad requested his deceased father's sword from the general. Napoleon recounted the story, quote, a boy of 12 or 13 presented himself to me and entreated that his father's sword should be returned. I was so touched by this affectionate request that I ordered it to be given to him. This boy was Eugene Borhane. On seeing the sword, he burst into tears. I felt so much affected by his conduct that I praised him much. A few days afterward, his mother came to return me a visit of thanks. I was much struck with her appearance, and still more with her esprit, end quote. As the story goes, Napoleon and Eugene's widowed mother, Josephine, quickly fell in love. They married in 1796, just before Napoleon took command of the Army of Italy. Eugene was brought along as an aide to his new stepdad, and thus launched a military career that would last almost 20 years. Eugene's physique was described as that of a, quote, long, lean cavalryman, end quote. And he was coached constantly in the art of warcraft by Napoleon. Topics could include intricate military strategies and tactics, or mundane topics such as where to camp your army for the night. For example, Avoid marshy or swampy areas to prevent infection in your troops. Napoleon referred to him as, quote, my son, end quote, and the two developed a natural affection for each other. 
The quick learning Eugene served in Massena's division and was promoted to lieutenant in 1797. The following year, Eugene served as aide de camp in Napoleon's conquest of Egypt. He saw action in the sieges of Jaffa and Acre, being wounded in the head during the latter battle. When Napoleon decided to leave the army behind and return to France, Eugene was one of the sacred few that he brought back with him. Once back in France, Eugene and Hortense helped mend fences between Napoleon and their mom. Both had been unfaithful to each other. In 1799, Eugene supported the coup for power, and Napoleon became First Council of France. In return, Eugene was appointed captain in the Councilor Guard and served with distinction in the 1800 Battle of Marengo. He served under the command of future Marshal Bessier. It was said that Eugene led charge after charge, despite soldiers falling around him. A few years later, he was made General of Brigade. Then, in 1804, Eugene was named Prince of the Empire. In the hierarchy of the Napoleonic Empire, this was the second highest tier. The emperor and an empress were the highest, followed by Napoleon's immediate family, his siblings, and Prince Eugene. This tier was even above the marshals, which is probably why, despite his battlefield accomplishments, he was never made a marshal. It would have been a demotion of sorts. In 1805, after Napoleon placed the legendary iron crown on his own head, he named Eugene Viceroy of Italy. From then on, Eugene ruled northern Italy under the directives of Napoleon. Southern Italy was ruled by Napoleon's brother Joseph at this time, and then Marshal Murat after he became king of Naples. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All in one place, for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I've really enjoyed the ease of use and the distribution ability of this platform. In January 1806, Eugene was formally adopted by Napoleon, but he was excluded from the succession plans for the French throne. A few days later, Eugene married his wife, Princess Augusta Amelia of Bavaria, in a pairing arranged by Napoleon and the King of Bavaria. Although it was a marriage of political reasons, the couple had a happy marriage, producing seven children. One of their daughters, Josephine, would go on to marry the son of Marshal Bernadotte, who was ruling Sweden as king. And thus, the granddaughter of Empress Josephine became Queen of Sweden in 1844 and part of a dynasty that exists to this day. Another daughter of Eugene became Empress of Brazil. Eugene's wife would outlive him by almost 30 years, passing in 1851. Getting back to our story, Viceroy Eugene was his typically diligent self as he governed Italy. He reorganized public finances, built roads, drained marshes, and introduced the French legal system and civil code. Despite being in nominal control of the region, he had to report to the emperor on every detail. A joke went around that he had to ask permission from Paris to put out a fire in Milan. But overall, 
he proved to be an efficient administrator. In 1809, a resurgent Austria would put Eugene's military skills to the test. In April of that year, Eugene's career as an independent field commander began with a loss to Archduke John. A good portion of Eugene's, quote, French army, end quote, was made up of Italian troops. In addition, Eugene had never led more than a regiment into battle, so his learning curve was much higher in commanding 37,000 troops and 54 cannons. It was said that Napoleon's letters to Eugene during his first independent command were, quote, a virtual field manual, end quote, on how to lead an army. Despite his stepfather's tips and tricks, Eugene suffered 9,000 casualties and lost 23 cannons along with one eagle. Eugene summed up the loss to his wife, saying it was, quote, the complete rout of our army, end quote. Napoleon was predictably furious, and even considered replacing him with Marshal Murat. Instead, Napoleon dispatched future Marshal MacDonald to act as military advisor to Eugene. A few weeks later, Eugene lost another battle to Archduke John at Caldero, but his casualties were lighter this time. Finally, in May 1809, Eugene won his first major victory at the Battle of Piave River, inflicting almost 4,000 casualties on the Austrians and capturing 15 cannons. A few weeks later, Eugene won again at the Battle of Tarvis, again causing huge damage to the Austrian army. Afterwards, Eugene was ordered to report to Vienna for Napoleon's counterstroke against the Austrians. The emperor had just suffered his first major defeat in a decade at the Battle of Aspern Essling. Napoleon brought in troops from around the empire to reinforce his army. As Eugene was making his way to join the main French army, he fought one more battle at Rab and again found victory. Eugene's 40,000 troops inflicted 10,000 casualties on the Austrians, and more importantly, prevented Archduke John from reaching the main part of the Austrian army. This to help cinch Napoleon's victory at Wagram. And again, the Austrians were forced to sue for peace. The 27-year-old Eugene was a quick study and learned how to become a winning independent commander in just a few months. But a challenge of a different kind was on the horizon. Napoleon was trying to secure his legacy with an heir to the throne, but Josephine had been unable to produce a child. So, the emperor divorced her in December 1809. This put Eugene and his sister Hortense in a tough position. They, of course, supported their mother, but Napoleon expected their loyalty at the same time. The emperor declared to Hortense, quote, The decision is made. It is irreversible. The whole of France wants the divorce. They cry out for it. I cannot ignore their wishes. Nothing will bring me back, not tears, not prayers. End quote. Hortense replied that she and Eugene would leave with her mother. Napoleon replied defiantly, quote, What? You will all leave me? You will abandon me? You no longer love me? Is that it? If we're or simply for my happiness, I would sacrifice it. But it is for France. You should be consoling me for being forced to give up the dearest of my affections. End quote. Eugene smoothed things over between all parties, saying, quote, My mother, my sister, and myself owe everything to the emperor. To us, he has been a true father. In us, Shall he at all times find devoted children and submissive subjects? End quote. After the divorce was finalized, Eugene returned to his administrator duties in Italy and remained there until he was recalled in 1812 for the invasion of Russia.
it can be accurately said that only a few French officers had their military reputations improve in Russia. Ney was one, Eugene was another. Prince Eugene would lead 45,000 French and Italian troops into the invasion, but only 2,000 would return. Eugene performed well at the battles of Smolensk, Borodino, Malioroslavets, and Krasny. He also helped rescue Ney's corps after they were cut off from the main part of the army during the retreat to France. In December 1812, Napoleon left the army to hurry back to Paris to begin rebuilding his forces. Marshal Murat was left in charge of the remnants of Napoleon's army in Russia. But the vain Murat soon departed the army to return to his kingdom in Naples. This left the French army in a precarious situation. The remaining marshals and generals were constantly bickering with each other, and few would listen to orders from colleagues who were of equal rank. Marshal Berthier proposed a solution by making Prince Eugene commander-in-chief. He was respected by a majority of the generals, and even the most headstrong marshals such as Ney, Victor, and Davu. Thankfully for the French army, Eugene accepted the position and succeeded in extricating the remaining troops from Russia. Once back in Germany, Eugene set up defensive lines to prepare for the coming Allied onslaught on Napoleon's empire. In 1813, Napoleon arrived back at the front, and Eugene fought under his command at the Battle of Lutzen. Following this victory, Eugene was sent back to Italy to stabilize the situation there and in the Illyrian provinces. He worked tirelessly, according to his quartermaster, quote, He did not sleep, marching always the last, and never leaving a soldier behind, end quote. His wife's father suggested that if he turned on Napoleon, the Allies might reward him by making him king of Italy. Eugene replied, quote, If the emperor's star is fading, then it is all the more reason for those of us who had shared in his glories to remain faithful. End quote. In 1814, Eugene fought successful battles against the Austrians, even while Napoleon's empire was on the brink of disaster during the invasion of France. Eugene continued to hold his ground and fought all the way through Napoleon's first abdication in April of that year. Eugene then retired to Bavaria to live with his wife's family, but kept correspondence with his stepfather while he was exiled in Elba. Eugene briefly returned to Paris in 1814 to attend Josephine's funeral. He was made a duke by his father-in-law and worked quietly on expanding his art collection. In 1815, when Napoleon shocked the world by escaping from Elba for the Hundred Days back on the French throne, Eugene remained neutral and stayed in Bavaria. Some say his father-in-law held him captive in Bavaria, while others say Eugene had promised Tsar Alexander of Russia that he would never take up arms again. One can only wonder if Napoleon's Waterloo campaign might have turned out differently if Prince Eugene was one of his corps commanders. After Napoleon's final exile to St. Helena, Eugene worked to help ex-soldiers of the Grand Armée who had fallen on difficult times. Unfortunately, he died prematurely in 1824 from a cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 42. In summarizing his career, Eugene was one of the few family-based appointments that actually worked out well for Napoleon. He and his sister Hortense were the standouts amongst the betrayals of his sister Caroline, his brother-in-law Murat, and the repeated failures of his brothers Jerome, Louis, and Lucien. Eugene was a first-rate tactician and resilient when suffering defeat. He also avoided the petty jealousies that plagued the ranks of the marshals, 
and provided a steadying presence to Napoleon's empire. I believe we'll wrap up on this point. Join us next time when we learn about the British general, Roland Hill, the right-hand man of the Duke of Wellington. Thanks for listening.